All right, we're now live for the December Ask Me Anything session. It's a uh, sunny but super cold day here in Milwaukee. I guess there's some serious winds out there. Um, got myself a nice non-alcoholic. Let's see who this is by. Brooklyn uh, Special Effects Hoppy Amber. So some little enjoyment for the uh, time as we go along. We've already got some good questions lined up. And um, let's take the first one. I don't have quite the same kind of answer that I think Carl Bod might be looking for. Uh, what have proven to be the most helpful text thinkers in developing your ability to Sadlerize Fools? So if you don't know the context of that, Sadlerizing was something that got coined as a term back when I was in grad school. And um, I was pretty aggressive with other students and even professors. And, you know, um, what was it to Sadlerize to like, you know, ruthlessly destroy another person, show that they had no clue what they were talking about. And I don't really do that so much these days. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty restrained in comparison to how I used to be. And I don't think that there was any particular philosopher who was helpful in helping to me to do that. I was just good at arguing and I had a lot of stuff at my disposal. And I ran into a lot of people who were, you know, kind of pretentious uh, or precious or didn't know what they were talking about or jumped on, you know, some sort of bandwagon. Like, you know, back then, Levinas was a big thing and everybody said the same basic things about effacing the face of the other. And, you know, you kind of just, you learn the shtick and you, you go after them. So, you know, I guess the only thing I could say is knowing the text better than the other people did, um, what was made it possible for me to do that. I, I mean, I guess you could say that some philosophers might be viewed as enablers because Sadlerizing is not good behavior. It's not collegial. It's kind of being a jerk to jerks. And um, maybe Nietzsche played a, a significant role in that. I suppose maybe Sartre, uh, who I read a lot of at the time, who holds people responsible for the positions that they take. So that's, that's really about all I have to say on, on that one. Galen asks, um, Leo Strauss considered Heidegger maybe the most important philosopher of his own time, but said he wouldn't meet him because he couldn't bring himself to shake his hand because of his personal life. Obviously, you know, Heidegger belonged to the Nazi party. Is there anyone that you feel similarly about whose work you respect and feel is important, but who as a person is so objectionable? that while you would read and commend their work, you would not associate. I, I don't know. I, nobody comes to mind offhand. Um, I mean, I, I, there's a lot of people who you hear that they're kind of jerks. I mean, there's, there's probably people that I've worked with on occasion, and they were just too much of a pain in the ass to continue working with them again, but I don't know that any of them had the stature of a, a Heidegger. So it's kind of hard for me to think of somebody myself who I would, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's people that are like pop culture gurus that I don't think I would want to have anything to do with, like Jordan Peterson or Sam Harris or people like that. But I don't consider them to be real thinkers. Um, they're definitely not up to the scale of a, a Martin Heidegger. Um, I guess you know maybe they're they're up to the scale of an Ayn Rand or a Oswald Spengler, you know. But so there's nobody like Heidegger level who I would say, yeah, I I respect their work, but they're such an asshole. I won't have anything to do with them. So, yeah. Laps, uh, nine continuum. Many thinkers have supposed the existence of universals is contrary to time in some way. Seems necessary. There's types of events, for example, days, thoughts on the relation. In other words, perhaps time and abstract entities are correlative or each necessary for the other. I mean, I think that totally depends on what you're understanding by time and universal. It's not as if there's a single theory out there that all philosophers agree upon. Um, even when it comes to the nature of time, let alone universals. So 
there's no answer to that um, because there isn't any generic universals. Um, Sam says, do you think there can be a convincingly systematic view of Plato's thought or is his works too diverse and complex to be easily systematized? I think there are convincingly systematic views of Plato's thought out there. I mean, that's part of what Neoplatonism as a movement consisted in. It's whether you buy into it or not. They certainly were interested in trying to bring together that stuff. And you also have middle Platonists like um, Alkinous, you know, with the handbook of Platonism. I would say Plutarch is kind of doing his own interesting eclectic thing, but he certainly is indebted to Plato. Um, I think if all you've got to work with are Plato's works um, and you're trying to put together a systematic overarching account, you're going to run into some problems here and there. So you always got to kind of smooth <laughs> some things out, right? But um, I mean, I would say the challenge is actually to read and understand all those works in, in the first place. Um, vegan Sports Bar, thought on the world as will and representation. Is this an aura text. So this is uh, referencing the video that I released yesterday about texts with uh, auras, meaning that they're the kind of texts that lots of people talk about, but don't actually read much of. And, um, you know, they, they make appeals to them. They treat them almost as if they're like commodities or consumer products. Somebody, I forget exactly who it was, made the great suggestion that, you know, we could call these texts um, fetishized texts as well. And yeah, I mean, world is will and representation has had that kind of appeal. Um, Schopenhauer has gone in and out of, um, of favor. You know, when I was a graduate student, there were very few people interested in Schopenhauer unless they were like doing stuff on Schopenhauer and Indian philosophy. And in the last, you know, 20, 30 years, there's been kind of a boom of interest in him. Um, maybe because of his pessimism, you know. So, yeah, I think there's there's quite a few people who like to talk about Schopenhauer but haven't actually, like, worked their way through world as will and representation. Um, it, so, you know, I mean, if there's a lot of texts out there that could be aura texts, texts with auras that people are chattering about but not really... Um, reading. Um, Rob Wickline, why does Nietzsche have such a big problem with dialectics? I don't know that he has a big problem with dialectics. It's not his, uh, not his style. I think he thinks that um, the way in which um, Hegelian dialectical thinkers, because that's mainly what he has in, in mind. I mean, he, he complains about his own early work as being too, too along those lines. It's too neat, you know. It's um, the the idea that you can bring things together into these comprehensive views that take in just about everything and you know uh, sublate the important stuff in there. Nietzsche just doesn't buy that. Um, but I, I don't think that you know complaining about dialectics is really something all that central in his his work. Um, Jake says, do you have any thoughts on the writings of Isaiah Berlin or general opinion of him as a philosopher? He was a great wordsmith. Um, he was, you know, interesting in, in terms of like uh, formulating stuff that we can uh, play around with, like, you know, distinction between negative and positive freedom. Um, I don't read an awful lot of him, um, so I'm, I'm not... At this point in time, although I do need to like actually do a few videos on some stuff for my my students, I haven't like read around in his work all that much, so I, I don't have much to say about him. Um, Rob, can we recognize differences among objects without connecting them to a genus? Yeah, why not? Um, I, I don't know that we have to uh, have a you know big like hierarchical structure in order to recognize differences between things. Uh, Jay Crass, philosophical question, mustache or goatee? Not a philosophical question at all. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I, don't <laughs> I don't know what we would um, uh, 
say about that. I mean, I've got both, right? By by virtue by virtue of having a goatee, you have a mustache, I suppose you could say. All right, uh, who do we have next? Um, Maximum, do you think it's necessary to read Kant's Critique of Pure Reason before reading Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit? Two of the texts that have a big aura, you could say. No. Um, and why would you think it's more important to read Kant's first critique than read his second critique or third critique? I mean, the Phenomenology of Spirit is less about epistemology and metaphysics and more about the development of human culture and there's you know massive sections devoted to ethics in there so why would you think that uh one critique is the most important one unless you've like just heard that it's an important work um i mean if you want to like set up prerequisites for understanding hegel aristotle is just as important as kant is you know um and uh you know you probably would also need to read some of the people after Kant that are that are closer to him. And you definitely need to need, read a lot of Rousseau as well. So I, I, I this is kind of a, um, a non-starter question. I mean, the first time you read the, the phenomenology, you're only going to get maybe, you know, at best one-tenth of what's going on in it anyway. You're going to have to reread it. So you go back to it, right? Nesk, Nesk, what are the current assumptions about the concept of quality? I don't, I don't have any idea. <laughs> I don't know what you mean by that. Dean, what is platonic dialectic broadly construed and what is it not? So dialectic is, is one of those terms that gets used by different people in different ways. Platonic dialectic, you know, is talking back and forth about something. Uh, some people, sometimes people want to say, oh, it has to be question and answer. And if you actually read Plato's text, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. But it's something that you work out, dia, through, uh, you know, legging, talking or speaking with, with each other. And, you know, you try to zero in on definitions if they're possible to provide. There's a lot of like, let's make some assumptions clear. Let's examine um, accounts and arguments. And that, that's what platonic dialectic is. I mean, sometimes it's talked about as uh, composing and dividing. And sure, that's part of it as well. Um, I don't think there's anything particularly mysterious about it. It's doing what we do in, in philosophy and in so many other fields of life. You know, I mean, I think you could say that one thing that is key to it is that there is a connection between, in, in Plato's text, between the style and approach of a person and their character and their structure of motivations. Um, and that Socrates also is very, very interested in seeing what people think, not just what they think other people think, but what they they actually think for themselves, you know. Um, Rob says, I'm rather confused about the difference between end and good in the Nicomachean ethics. I've read the glossary entries. They seem to share so much overlap. I can't totally square where they start in the end. Well, there's your answer. Um, there is an a lot of overlap, so don't try to separate them out from each other. An end is something that you're aiming at. Ends are goods. Case closed, you know. Um, I think a lot of cases like this, you want to avoid, like, confusing yourself by importing assumptions about how things have to be same or different. Uh, ben Cloak, what do you think of Heidegger's Das Mann? Do you think it's an accurate depiction of social life? How much do you think it plays a role in Heidegger's Nazi views? I don't think it plays anything in, in Heidegger's Nazi views. It's it's uh, an independent concept that you can find in plenty of people who are not Nazis or people before they're Nazis. Like Heidegger didn't join the Nazi party at the time that he formulated that concept. Um, das Mann just means like the crowd or, you know, the, the they is how it's usually translated. And I mean, this is a commonplace in existentialist philosophy from Kierkegaard all the way on through, you know, Nietzsche and Shestoff and people like that. You know, Gabriel Marcel uh, talks in similar ways. Jean Paul Sartre talks in similar ways. The idea is that there's a, well, Ortega y Gasset is another great example. Um, there's this sort of like flattened out, um, everyday, superficial, 
people uh, living lives that uh, lack what you know Rilke would call solitude, and um, you know people who kind of you know they have an identity, but it's it's not really their own identity. It's just something they've kind of accepted, and they engage in superficial, customary ways of of it, engaging with each other in the world and. You know, I think is there a truth to this this idea? Sure, yeah. I mean, again, Heidegger is not saying anything that's particularly new here. Um, it's just got a different name than than what Kierkegaard or Nietzsche or Shestoff or you know Ortega y Gasset called it. Um, so yeah, and I, I don't think it has any intrinsic connection to Nazism. Uh, Said, I've been reading, trying to read up on German idealism for someone who's quite a novice in philosophy. What philosophers do you suggest I begin with, and where do I go from there? I mean, Kant, and uh, you know, I would say uh, if you want to like start out with the easier works, read the Prolegomena, which is supposed to be a you know summary of the first critique. It isn't really, but it's it's good enough. Uh, the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals and. You know, you might actually want to read the actual metaphysics of morals. Um, you can get a good idea about what Kant's project is by looking at religion within the limits of uh, reason alone. And, uh, you know, you want to read, there's a whole bunch of different people that figure into German idealism and are also critics of it. But, you know, who are the most important people? You know, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel. Um, I mean, that's going to keep you busy for a long time, just poking around in their works. So, and once you do, you'll get a better idea of who might, who else might be interesting to take a look at. Uh, Ridicule says thoughts on the sewer socialism movement in Milwaukee. Is that something like the framework you'd like to see socialists take in the present? I don't even know what sewer socialism is. Um, it must be pretty obscure if it hasn't got onto my radar. As a matter of fact, I should probably look it up. And, and since it's in my hometown, uh, they probably haven't done a, a great job of um, getting getting uh, their word out. Oh, okay. So it looks like um, there's a bunch of different entries for it. Um, reformism rather than revolution, focusing on sort of meliorism, cleaning up the legacy of that. Oh, great. Yeah. So that's, I think that that sounds like good stuff overall. Um, it's not something I was familiar with. All right. Um, vegan sports bar. Have you ever read any Vladimir Nabokov? Yeah, I read uh, Lolita back when I was in college because it was in our world literature class. And uh, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't quite interesting enough for me, me to want to read anymore, Nabokov. Um, I, you know, with a lot of these authors, it's unfortunate that you read them because they've got this massive reputation and, you know, they're like, oh, you must read these people because I, I was kind of disappointed with the work. I didn't find it as to live up to the hype. And so, you know, given the scarcity of time, I just never got around to reading any other uh, Nabokov. Um, so Useless Projects has an interesting one. You once answered when, you, when asked if you could meet three people dead or alive, who you'd like to meet. Socrates wouldn't be a choice because he thought he was a bit of an ass. Why do you think he's an ass? Read the Platonic Dialogues and then see what you think. I mean... He uh, makes, you know, he in the, the apology, he says, oh, you know, people charge that I make the, the bad arguments seem good or the weaker arguments seem stronger. He does that sometimes, right? He makes bad arguments in, in his stuff and he pokes fun at people and, um, you know, he goes to dinner parties and wants to interrupt it with all sorts of philosophical conversation. And sometimes that's cool and sometimes that's being an ass, you know. Um, I don't think it's it's a very controversial view unless you like lionize Socrates to say he is kind of an ass. Um, and I don't, I don't think I'd want to hang out with him, you know. Um, so Inzi, who's your favorite philosopher? As I always say, I don't have one. Will you do anything on Asian philosophy? I'm not a specialist in Asian philosophy. 
Zeno, I've been following your lectures on anger. It's been insightful. Yeah, there's there's a, there's a lot of great philosophical works that people don't often read having to do with anger. It was viewed as a central problem in ancient and uh, you, I think you could also say medieval and even early modern philosophy, how to understand and deal with this emotion. But most of the discussions of it get kind of uh, overlooked unless you're in a psychology or a philosophy of emotion class or a psychology class, if they actually read any texts. And, uh, you know, so it, we, we probably should raise some of those up. Uh, Andy, a metaphysical question. Do you think we should believe philosophical claims on testimony? Keith Allen claims we shouldn't since philosophy is not truth directed. Never heard of Keith Allen. Uh, and why somebody would say philosophy is not truth directed, that's kind of a non-starter for me. Uh, philosophy is truth directed. Maybe the way Keith Allen does it, it's not. Um, and I don't know what it means to accept philosophical or believe philosophical claims on testimony. I suspect he's using that in some, you know, jargony, specialized way. Uh, Rizard, does Nietzsche hold the noble and slave distinction? Could it be the case that this distinction is a temporary view, one that set up a possibility of going beyond good and evil? Um, no, uh, this is in, this is absolutely integral to Nietzsche's work. I mean, it shows up in so many different works. It's not just something that's temporary. And what you've got mixed up there is uh, master morality is beyond good and evil. It's because it's good and bad, not good and evil. Slave morality is uh, is uh, good and evil. That's how it, it, it structures itself. So no, that's, that's uh, I mean, there are some things that where I think myself, like eternal recurrence of the same. A lot of people make a big deal out of that. I think that's not that, that important for understanding Nietzsche. Um, but master morality and slave morality as valuations, that's absolutely central to his work. So, um, Frederick, what does epistemology mean in philosophy for you? Well, it's a domain of philosophy. It's uh, you know, concerned with some really central questions like what's, what's truth? How do we know things? And, you know, we engage in it all the time, like when we're thinking about should I accept this claim or not? What's my basis for that? It's not just epistemology, but that's that's a good part of it. Um, so, you know, like like most terms in philosophy, it, it's got multiple meanings. Um, I can't read that that person's what I'm assuming is perhaps uh, Arabic writing. Are you interested in postmodern philosophy? I'm interested mostly in, in uh, people getting the term postmodern right. And, uh, you know, it was, it was developed within French philosophy. Uh, Leotard, you know, puts it out there. And it, it means a number of different things. Um, it doesn't just mean the same thing as relativism or, you know, it's not the same thing as late 20th century writing or stuff like that. So it totally depends on what you actually mean by postmodern, but I think you can take a look at my YouTube channel and figure out whether the authors that I've covered count as postmodern and uh, that would answer it. Um, Zeno, do you think if God doesn't exist, it would be necessary to invent him? No. Um, I mean, you could have a conceptual scheme that doesn't have God with a capital G. Um, there's all sorts of available thoughts about what exceeds, you know, humanity or what transcends us or stuff like that. Um, and, you know, why would it be necessary? And then you'd have to say necessary in what, what sense, like logically necessary? Probably not um, necessary in order for people to feel that there's something more out there. I mean, even in ages of faith, half the people don't believe because you just look at their behavior and you can tell that they, they don't, you know. Uh, Silent Mandible, do you think Martin Buber's I and Thou can be related to dialectics? Uh, depends on what you mean by related. Um, I mean, Buber's uh, position is is developed dialectically and it's, you know, the I and thou are engaged dialogically. So why not? Um, 
but which dialectics do you mean? You know, Platonic dialectics, as we talked about earlier, Marxist dialectics, Hegelian dialectics, other people's, you know, later conception of dialectics, Aristotle's understanding, the Stoics, you know, I mean, dialectics is not a term that you, you can use without qualifying what kind you mean. Um, Diogenes, the cynic, favorite work of Bataille's. I imagine you're not as keen on the fiction compared to a cursed share eroticism. It's been a long time since I've read Bataille. Um, you know, he was kind of, you know, sort of a underground big thing when I was in grad school. So I don't, I don't really have a favorite work of, of his, I would say. All right. Um, Bilbo Baggins, do you think philosophers should believe their conclusions? Is philosophy today utterly distinct from the philosophy of Socrates, the Stoics? There is no such thing as philosophy today, uh, any more than there was any such thing as philosophy in ancient Greece. There's philosophies, and they overlap, and they intersect. And it's very difficult to make accurate generalizations that aren't going to have all sorts of exceptions about any era of philosophy. Um, I mean, you can answer your own question by thinking about whether there are people in the present doing philosophy who engage with Socrates or the Stoics. And the answer, of course, would be yes. <laughs> I'm one of them, you know, and there are many others. So is, is it, you know, utterly distinct? Of course not. I mean, are, are any philosophies utterly distinct from each other? What would it mean to be utterly distinct? You know, um, laps for continuum. Here's an interesting metaphysical question. What is the soul on your view? I mean, I would say that I am uh, not quite a substance dualist, right? I think that the body and whatever we want to call it, the soul, what exceeds the body, are very closely interconnected, um, but that there is something more than just this, right? Um, and I, you know, I don't have a hell of a lot more of my own views on that. I mean, I, I have a lot of other people's views handy about that sort of thing, but I can't quite say that I have, you know, some sort of well-worked out position of my own. I will say this as a little bit of a joke, you know, Anselm of Canterbury was one of the smartest guys of his time. And on his deathbed, he, uh, he lamented the fact, according to his biographer, that he had not um, started on the next big topic that he had wanted to talk about, namely the nature of the soul, because he didn't think that anybody else in his time was actually going to make any progress uh, on the, the topic. So all right. Uh, Oliver Marcel says, have you read Robert Bolaño and or Julio, Julio Cortazar? Uh, nope, I haven't read either of them, nor have I even heard of them. Uh, but that, I mean, don't take that too personally. There's like tens of thousands of people out there authoring works in philosophy. And uh, obviously most of us have, have not encountered even more than a, a small sliver of them. Um, beach sweater, just a shout out philosophy major from university of Iowa here. Nice to see someone giving this kind of exposure, accessibility and intractability to the subject for others. Unimaginable 10 years ago. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of an interesting thing to say. Um, what was YouTube actually like 10 years ago? And were there any alternatives that would allow us to do this, this kind of live streaming thing? I, I, you know, I suspect there probably was something, but it just wasn't well publicized, you know? And when did YouTube come up with live streaming? I mean, it's it's been quite a while because I think my first things that I did were maybe like 2013. Um, so, you know, it's it's not quite 10 years ago, but it's close to 10 years ago. But, I mean, that was pretty small scale compared to what it's like now in the present. And there's so many other platforms that you can live stream on that people, I guess, are doing philosophy on. I don't know if it's any good, you know, the stuff that you're going to find on like Twitch or Discord or, you know, other, other things. 
Um, cause I, I don't have the time to, you know, check that stuff out. Um, but yeah, it is pretty cool. And I, I mean, we're pretty lucky that we live in the era that we do because I mean, if, if I'd been born 20 years earlier, I, you know, I was in terms of like uh, traditional academic stuff, I was making some pretty significant headway, um, you know, publishing a couple articles or book chapters a year, getting invited to participate in things, you know, working on book projects, as well as doing my, my traditional teaching. But, you know, if this medium <clears throat> hadn't been available, I, I wouldn't have like sought it out. Um, my first actual uh, foray into recording a lecture was when I was teaching at Indiana State Prison and the place was on lockdown for like five weeks. And I went out and bought a video camera at like Best Buy and recorded myself in my uh, basement library office and put it onto a VCR cassette. Took it to the prison, and of course, it was a complete mess. They didn't play it at the right time for my students, and I had all sorts of other people coming up to me afterwards saying, "You're that guy on the on the video," you know? and uh, you know that's that that was the state of the art back in 2005, 2006, or whenever it was. So yeah, things have really changed quite a bit. Uh, Silent Mandible, have you heard anything about the newly discovered Hegel papers? Yeah, they, they seem to be early stuff that has to do primarily with aesthetics, which sounds very interesting. Um, I don't I don't know if they've actually gone through all of them at this point. I haven't I haven't been paying. You know, I saw the 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 uh, news when it came out and then there were all the jokes about, oh, it's going to like radically revise, you know, what we're saying about Hegel and stuff like that or you know, jokes on you if you think this is going to make Hegel any more comprehensible. Um, and then it, it's just been kind of quiet because I think now they have to figure out what they're going to actually do with them, you know. So um, it'll be interesting to see. You know, I mean, Hegel's aesthetics is not an area of his work that I have any real familiarity with. So... I'm not I'm not particularly well placed to say much about it. Um Perwazel, uh, do you have any suggestions on what to read after reading Kierkegaard? It doesn't have to be existentialism. Read it whoever you want. I mean, if you're if you want somebody who references Kierkegaard, then I mean you could read existentialist authors because they tend to be pretty big on him. Or you might like say, well, did Kierkegaard actually get Socrates right? Uh, let's go read some Platonic dialogues and some Xenophon. Or did Kierkegaard get Hegel right? Maybe we'll read some Hegel. Or Kierkegaard also, you know, praises Descartes in some places. So maybe you go and read some Descartes. It it all depends on what what your your goal is, I suppose. Um, Kyle says, "Do you prefer Hegel or Schopenhauer?" I don't, I don't prefer either. I mean, they're um, they're both good. Uh, I, I will say this because people, you know, every month or so, there's somebody who asks me about it as if they're like informing me about something I didn't know about. Uh, when Schopenhauer is criticizing Hegel, you know, if you know both authors, you just kind of ignore that as the the ravings of a uh, mostly on point, but at that at that point, envy driven um, bullshitter, you know. But, you know, the rest of Schopenhauer's stuff is worth checking out. Uh, it kind of depends on what you're, you're interested in, you know. They're both, uh, they're both good authors. Neither one is like the author who's got everything figured out. So, uh, Cornelius, you said in the past that Demons is, is your favorite Dostoevsky novel, but you never made a video about it. Do you have any plans about that in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that would be kind of kind of fun to do. Um, I haven't done any Dostoevsky for a while. Usually I'm doing stuff for my classes, and um, The Demons just isn't, uh, or The Possessed, just isn't a book that I've been um, teaching in, in my classes. So I've been, you know, focusing on stuff that I have been teaching, like Joseph Butler and, you know, Plutarch and all those people. But, yeah, I mean, down the line, I would, I'd actually like to do that. 
it does remain my favorite of his his novels. Um, I think it's got the most interesting stuff going on in it. I know a lot of people are like, no, Crime and Punishment or Brothers Karamazov. And those are good, but I find Brothers Karamazov kind of a, a slog. Um, and, you know, uh, I won't I won't say like some people say, oh, you could have trimmed it or something like that. No, it is what it is. But I just, I, I'm not that interested in reading the whole friggin' thing again. Whereas, you know, Maybe I'll reread the the demons and the possessed over Christmas break. I don't know. All right, um, Oliver Marcel, curious about your take on Knausgard. I don't have a take on Knausgard because I haven't read Knausgard. Um, one one point two. What's the relevance of ideas such as substance, essence, universals, particulars, and so in modern philosophy and science in general? I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. There's an in general for that. Uh, there isn't a modern philosophy in general. Um, so that's kind of a non-starter. Jake, when was the last time you were surprised by something in philosophy? Oh, that's that's a good one. Um, yeah, you know, let's think about different ways you could be surprised. You read something and you're like, holy shit, I didn't realize this person was interested in this and had something to say about this or knew about this, right? And then there's the being surprised by like how good something is, or, or sometimes being surprised how bad something is. And I'm kind of a forgetful guy, so I get surprised quite often. Um, and I would say, you know, I'm teaching this this class on Plato's dialogues online, and we've been we went through the Ion the. Euthyphro and the Apology so far. And now this coming week, we're doing the Credo, and then we're spending two weeks on the Phaedo. And I'll, I'll probably reprise that class next year sometime in my uh, Reason IO Teachable Academy um, rather than on Light Hall. As a side note, too, by the way, Light Hall is moving towards like workplace development kind of stuff and away from philosophy and music. So I'm, I'm not going to be doing any more classes with them after this one. Um, but, you know, rereading the Apology, which is a text that I teach, you know, probably um, at least once a year, um, there was, there was, you know, and looking at it closely, not sort of like thinking about, okay, what am I going to do today? Let's talk about the three main groups, right? Um, it was interesting to see him talking about the... Um, story of you know his smart ass friend Chiron saying is Socrates why is there anybody wiser than Socrates right and there's there's a couple shifts you got to be careful when you're reading platonic dialogues and Socrates is playing around with terms because the oracle did not say that Socrates was the wisest but Socrates at a certain point, says that the oracle said that. And you're like, whoa, that's not actually what the oracle said. And you're like, what's going on here? So that, that's kind of an interesting surprise. Um, Millward says, do you think existentialism philosophy has ruined a lot of things now? No, and I don't, I don't know why anyone would um, think that. I mean, existentialism somehow had the cultural significance to ruin a whole bunch of things. I mean, what fantasy world would you have to be living in to buy into that kind of story? Or who, who's, you know, whose take on the history of ideas would you have to buy into to, to believe that? Um, Rob Wickline, what X-rate philosopher do you consider Foucault? I mean, probably second rate. Um, I think that Foucault, for all of his, um, you know, historical research, you know, sometimes he says stuff and you're like, ah, oh, come on, that's not what the text actually says. You know, he's he's clearly like taking things and turning them into a narrative that that works for him. And he's, you know, he's a good researcher. Um, I think some of the stuff that he says is quite interesting. I don't know that it's like world shakingly profound. Um you know, and that reminds me. So like going back to this text with Aura thing, right? Who, 
if, if people were like super into Foucault, I think it kind of changed from time to time. Like, you know, for a while, the order of things was the book to read. And then it was the history of sexuality because you know, sexuality is so sexy. Right. And everyone was talking about the care of the self and stuff like that. Um, so what, what would it be now? I don't, I don't know. I think, it, I think it's not as if there's like a <clears throat> centralized Foucault community. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, Canalius, how is Schopenhauer's peculiar thoughts about women viewed or talked about in academia? Does it get brought up alongside his series of on series? I mean, Schopenhauer in general is not getting brought up a lot in academia. And you got kind of a broader topic here of male philosophers saying stupid things about women. Um, you know, I mean, Nietzsche, if you read Beyond Good and Evil, um, there's like, you know, in his discussion, I'm trying to remember which chapter it's in. Like, the this basically the second half of the chapter is just blathering on in stupid ways about women. And you're like... Do these guys actually understand women? Do they are they just misogynist? Do they just not pay close attention? You know, similar with Aristotle saying dumb shit about women. Um, I guess I just ignore that stuff now because life's a little bit too short, and you know, uh, I'd rather spend my time on on intelligent conversation rather than silly bullshit. Um, so how is how does academia look at it? I mean, I think you've got some people in academia that will do the gotcha thing. See, look how bad he is, you know. But I think most people, if they're reading Schopenhauer, are reading Schopenhauer because they want to focus on what's actually worthwhile in his his books, you know. So uh, Zeno says, I'm reading the ancient city of Coulange or by Coulange, a book about the laws of Rome, a bunch of other stuff, wondering if anyone else here has read it. Yeah, I read it years and years ago. Um, I mean, I, I think I was still in grad school when I read it, so it's been a long, long time. Philosophical Irish drunk, will you ever do a series of symbolic mathematical logic? There's no need for me to do so. There's already people out there doing that. Uh, my time is probably better spent focusing on things that other people don't do quite as well. Logic is pretty straightforward and, and easy to do well, I think, you know. Um, 1.2, thoughts on the concept of view or views in philosophy? I don't know what the concept of that is. Uh, if philosophy is the endeavor to truth, can there be only one correct view for each question ever? That's easy to answer. No, there can be multiple correct uh, views. Because uh, maybe views have to be put together, you know. Um, Fiol King something. Is that a denim and leather shirt? Any good metal albums you enjoyed this, this last year? Yeah, it is indeed. Let me see if I can show it to people. Saxon, denim and leather, one of their um, great albums, songs, ideas. You know, um, I wear this to the gym quite, quite frequently. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to see Saxon twice. Hopefully I'll get to see him again sometime before, you know, they uh, run out of steam. The time that I did see them, um, they were doing pretty good. So uh, metal albums from that I enjoyed this past year, lots and lots and lots of stuff. I mean, I post about this in social media when I'm at the gym, I'll typically take a screenshot of my Apple Music of what I've been um, see what I've been listening to lately, and you know a lot of what I'm doing is like re-listening. Um, I should probably just like look at my my photos and see what I've got in there. So like last time I was at the gym, I was listening to Angel Witch's debut album and Samson's. Uh, um, Head On album, really great. That's with, you know, Bruce Dickinson as their singer. Um, here's, you know, Saxon, The Power and the Glory, uh, Ace Freely, Freely's Comet, which starts out with Rock Soldiers, which is an awesome song. Um, uh, let's see who else we've got in here. Uh, just scroll back like a, a million years, stupid iPhone. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I could go on and on and on. Maybe I don't want to waste too much time on doing this, but I, you know, I'll listen pretty frequently to stuff. Um, and we were doing a thing reviewing more recent albums by classic metal bands. Um, we got to do some of that in the uh, uh, classic metal class that Steve, uh, Scott Trulli and I were, were doing before we kind of got wrapped up in, in stuff. Um, oh, you know, somebody I'll recommend. So Gillen. Um, if you haven't heard Ian Gillen's stuff that he did as a solo artist, really good. Um, he, he's somebody who I think is kind of under, underrated. Um, all right, dog wow. Why do philosophers look down on the practical applications of philosophy in the real world as being not that important? How an ideal real is important as it may have to change to work? I mean, who says that they do? I mean, some do, some don't. Um, clearly, I'm not one who looks down on practical applications of philosophy in the real world, provided people are actually applying the philosophy and not, you know, some watered down version of it. Um, I think there's, there's, you know, there's people who don't like it and then there's people who do like it. Um, but I, I think that there's more and more recognition that philosophy had better provide some sort of accounting for itself or else people are, are not going to fund it, you know? Um, made of clay. Here's a good pedagogical question. How do you view failing students, not ones who slack off per se, but ones who just weren't able to do well enough to pass? Do you have a philosophy about failing students besides the one given by the school? I mean, I grade people on the work that they do. Um, and sometimes people can't do the work for a variety of reasons. I mean, I, I just had one student who I'm going to give an incomplete to um, because the poor guy got COVID, you know, and uh, he was doing okay until he got it and uh, it, it messed him up pretty bad. And um, I've had it myself um, and I haven't, you know, physically been the same since COVID. But then again, you know, I, uh, I had a couple other strikes against me. I've had some other autoimmune issues with uh, mononucleosis as, as a kid, had, have had Lyme's twice, you know, I, uh, uh, I'm diabetic, so, and, and COVID messed all the, those sorts of things up. I'm, I'm lucky that, you know, what didn't happen was reactivation of other viruses. I, I've also had chicken pox too. So I fortunately had the shingles vaccine. And, you know, COVID put me out for like a good week and a half um, and then I had lots of fatigue and, you know, I, I have more muscle and joint pain since it than I've had before, had some brain fog. Um, so who knows what this poor guy's going through, right? Um, and I'll give him his incomplete and he'll either get the work done or he won't. And if he doesn't, I don't hold it against him. A, a lot of students will email me about, you know, like, being behind and they feel ashamed or upset with themselves or embarrassed. And I actually put a page in my, my classes that says, when you fall behind, read this, you know, and I stress to them that academics are not, you know, the totality of a person's life or value or anything like that. Sometimes uh, people have, have troubles, right? Um, and I have I have a lot of students who struggle. So what I do, my in every one of my classes, I let students hand in late work all the way up to the end of the semester. And I usually don't penalize them for it if they have any kind of good excuse. And I have no problem giving students incompletes, which allows them, you know, like at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, an additional 30 days to get work done. Uh, now, if they don't get the work done in that time, then they get an F. And that's just the way it goes. But I don't, I don't, you know, look at them bad because they got an F. Um, all right, let's see here. Just skipped a little bit. Um, Johan, how do you square your Catholic faith and your work as a philosopher in a pluralist and secular academia? I mean, that's not a challenge at all. Etienne Gilson and, and uh, you know, uh, Maurice Blondel did that. I mean, and that was over 100 years ago. So why would that be 
a challenge of any sort, you know. Um, as a matter of fact, there's probably more room in today's academy for having any sort of religious faith than there was in the French Third Republic. So, all right, Vegan Sports Bar, on your video of prudent priorities, how does one know what they're good at and what to prioritize? I'm in my early work 30s and feel unrealized. Well, you figure out what you're good at by trying things out and seeing what you have some enjoyment in and some aptitude for. I mean, some things you can figure out you're not good at right away. Some of the things you're not good at, you might be able to improve on, but you know, you have to figure out whether um, you're likely to make you know, progress. And then you got to decide what you, you want your life to include. You know, I mean, all of us can look at, um, so, you know, here's a prime example, right? I, I play bass guitar um, and uh, I'm never even going to be Nikki six good to use uh, one of the phrases of one of my friend Blitch um, who played in bands in, in uh, New York and LA and then, you know, moved out to LA and started his own fashion line. Now he does drug and alcohol um, counseling, and he's very, very good at that. Um, you know, he realized that he could be Nikki Six good, but he was never going to be Steve Harris good. But most of us aren't going to be Steve Harris good. Somebody who is potentially Steve Harris good is, um, I forget her name, but she's the bassist for the Iron Maidens. Uh, and she, we saw her on stage recently. Uh, well, we saw the whole band on stage. I was watching her primarily uh, because, you know, I, I like looking at the basis. And uh, she was just amazing. Um, playing Steve Harris's stuff is uh, pretty extraordinary. Um, Steph Harris is is what she goes by. Wanda Ortiz is is her actual name. Steph Harris is her uh, stage name. And, um, you know, am I ever going to be at that level? No, I'm never going to be at that level. So I'm not going to like prioritize bass playing in my, my life, but you, you know, you got to try things out and you figure out what you're good at. And then you decide not just in terms of those things, but also in terms of your other life priorities. I mean, do you want to have a spouse? Do you want to have children? Do you, you know, do you want to travel? Uh, do you want to put aside money for retirement? All of these things are also priorities, right? For your life. Do you want to learn how do you want to learn other skills like how to cook well, uh, which can contribute to all of these other things in, in important ways? So these are all things that you got kind of have to think through. And now to go to I'm in my early work 30s and I feel unrealized. Okay, I I, I can relate to that. Um I think we all go through things like that, except for those who are really lucky and like find their calling right away and there's a need for their calling right away, right? Uh, that's not most of us. I think most of us do have, uh, and maybe other people want to chime in uh, about this. I think most of us have feelings of not being fulfilled at certain points or not being, you know, fully realized. Our potential is not being met in, in certain respects. So I, I, it will, hopefully that, that helps. Jonathan Rosenzweig says, um, any connections to be made between Heidegger's essay on technology, the question concerning technology that is, and social media like Facebook or Instagram, are they standing reserve? So standing reserve is a key concept that is coming out of that, right? And the idea is that... Um, let's call them just matters in general, become viewed as something that is uh, numerable and can be drawn upon and used, like put into you know, a process. And with Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or anything like that, it's not the platform that is the standing reserve. The platform itself, you know, there, there's this, um, this slogan, that if you're getting it for free, you're the product, right? And that is the way that things, that's what's being done to human beings through the social media. They're, they're constantly gathering information on you, right? So Facebook years and years ago started putting together these 
profiles on people, as does Google, as does Microsoft. All, all these big tech companies are doing that. And, you know, they figure out an awful lot about you by what you post and how you respond to things. And sometimes even like how long you spend on, on something. And all of this is, winds up being digitized and exploited. And you see that, you know, like Facebook sold a lot of people's information, right, to, to allow them to be exploited in terms of uh, commercial matters and, and um, voting and politics and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think, I think that um, we could say, and it's not just Heidegger and the question concerning technology that would be useful. You think about um, going back to Kierkegaard, right? And a lot of people have drawn connections between his discussion of the public and leveling in the present age and, and social media. There's, there's quite a few things. We could talk about Nietzsche's master and slave morality, perhaps, in that respect. Or I actually, this is, this is, you know, this would be kind of an interesting thing to turn into a class, wouldn't it? Looking at tech platforms and what they do with us. But I don't know that I would be the guy to do that. So, hey, Bruce, Bruce Moore is here as well. Long time, uh, uh, what we would, you know, interlocutor who's become a friend uh, over the years. So good to see you there as well. Um, let's see here. Sam Brindley, what's the correct philosophy? That depends on what you want to do with it, I guess, right? Cola Moose, um, not a question, but some news. Oh, this is good. I recently received news. I got into St. John's College. I want to thank you for all the help you and your videos have given me with my studies. So Cola Moose is another uh, longtime interlocutor, a young person who is a uh, rising, I think, rising senior, um, who's uh, been involved in discussions about um, speculative fiction. And, you know, if you don't know about St. John's, it's a, it's a college that is devoted, this goes back to the dialectic thing, to engaging students dialectically. You, you study texts and you, you know, you have a, um, I forget exactly what they call the people that are essentially like tutors. They come in and they, they like, you know, provoke you into thinking about things. And it's very, very interactive. Um, I don't know if I could be a professor at a place like that, frankly. It might not be good for, for somebody like me. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's really wonderful news. So I'm, I'm happy to, to read that. Uh, Zeno, do you like When Nietzsche Wept? I haven't, I haven't seen When Nietzsche Wept. Um, as a matter of fact, I really haven't seen, I should spend some time watching movies about philosophers because there's that Hannah Arendt movie and stuff like that. So I should check that out. Uh, Siddharth says, is there money in philosophy? Eh, sometimes and sometimes not. <laughs> I mean, is, is, there's money in anything, I suppose. And, you know, there's certainly people out there who figured out how to make tons and tons of money out of um, peddling uh, watered down philosophy because that, that tends to be what sells. But if you're doing, you know, real work, maybe not quite as much. But I, I've certainly been able to make a living with it. But I've been pretty fortunate. Uh, Mohit, I am from India. Some tips for language. I'm not sure what, what you'd mean by, by that. Um, I mean, there's a lot to say about language, but I, I think I need some, <clears throat> some um, further prompts. Um, v, v, no question, but I'm hope, hoping you're doing well. I am, I am doing pretty well, you know. Uh, the semester is coming to an end. Um, and uh, that'll be nice because I'll have more time to get things done before the next semester starts. Um, looking forward to some downtime. Siddharth, uh, did you read any of the Hindu philosophy? Yeah, because I've actually taught classes on, you know, uh, not just world religions, but also non-Western philosophy, but I'm not an expert. I don't read, you know, Sanskrit or Pali or any of that sort of stuff, so I'm always a little bit um, humble when it comes to uh, willingness to, to talk about that kind of stuff. Damon, any advice on how to learn to read Greek? Um, well, I mean, the way that I learned languages is not generally the way I, I suggest to other people to learn to read languages. I, I think it's good to like take a course, you know, and when it came to Greek, that is in fact what I did. I took a uh, 
a course on classical Greek with with starting out with Rick Williams for a year, um, who was the head of the classics department at Southern Illinois University, long since retired. And we started out with 12 people. By the end of the semester, we had four left of those four that started the next semester, two of us finished. And then it was on to like doing readings. Um, you know, you read some Lucian or some Plato or, or whoever else, uh, you know, so I did some of that and then eventually started doing like, you know, independent studies. But, you know, by the time that I got to Greek, I already had, you know, a, a good facility with with Latin, French, and German. And I, I was very much into Indo-European linguistics. So, you know, I would look at um, the grammars and they would talk about that stuff. But I think most people that's not particularly helpful for them, you know, and I'm also the kind of person who doesn't, I'm not interested so much in learning the paradigms. I'm much more interested in learning the intricate connections of rules and historical developments of language. I don't think that's particularly helpful for most learners, you know. Uh, Scotland, shame. I was wondering what you think about Socrates saying philosophy is preparing for death. I'm also happy to report the master's is going well here in Edinburgh. Oh, I, I know who this is. Um, so, yeah, actually, I, I got to write you. I got to email you. That's a good reminder because uh, this is Andy. Um, I'm going to have to see if we can chat perhaps over, over the Christmas break. Um, yeah, so is, is philosophy preparing for death? Yeah, I mean, that can be a function of philosophy. Um, and you probably should think about death to some degree because it is it is pretty important, you know. But is, maybe that gets a little bit overdone, you know. Maybe there's, there's so much more else to philosophy. Um, Roman, any recommendations on philosophy and the application of it to life as a student? So, you know, most... Most of the philosophers that, that you might read, you can ask, well, how would this actually apply to the real world, as we call it, right? Um, and I think that's that's perfectly fine to do. Sometimes, you know, you know, so think about Derrida, for example. Really fun to read, and it's complicated, and there's cool ideas, and he's engaging all these other philosophers. It's very challenging to think about, well, how would I apply this in my actual engagement with other people without just doing word games or stuff like that, right? Um, he's, he's kind of a tough person to apply, but there's some things that, that you could draw out of his work that might be useful, you know. Um, and, you know, other philosophers are a lot more close to ordinary existence, particularly those who do stress the application of philosophy to, to life. Think about William James and you know his version of pragmatism. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of him, actually. I like him quite a bit. Um, all right, Orlando, is it wise to start reading The Republic? Never read any philosopher, any philosophy, and just getting into it. Yeah, maybe I wouldn't start out with the Republic. Um, if you're gonna, I mean, Plato's a good person to start out with, but I wouldn't jump right into that. I would start with, you know, some of the other dialogues. I typically start people out with, um, you know, the ones that are centered around Socrates' trial and death, and then add to that the Mino and the Ion as like a nice six dialogue starting place. Um, and then you can decide like, do I want to go into the Republic next or maybe into the symposium or maybe into, you know, the Gorgias and, and Protagoras or, you know, where, where do I want to go from, from there? Um, but there's nothing that says you have to start with Plato. You can, you can start anywhere you'd like to. I mean, I certainly didn't start with Plato. Um, and you know, I turned out okay. Right. So, all right, uh, Siddharth Schopenhauer said that studying the Upanishads was the solace of his life. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm sure it was the solace of, of his life. And, you know, there's a lot of interesting connections between Schopenhauer and Indian philosophy. Different, uh, different things for different people, I would say. Um, I've never had a solace of my life in reading the Upanishads, but I think that they're certainly interesting to, to read through. Diogenes, do you ever go through periods of book burnout? 
I bet that'd be a real pain in the ass in your line of work. Yeah, sometimes I do. Um, and it, it, it's not like book burnout, like reading per se, like I don't ever want to read a book, but maybe I don't want to read the stuff that I'm supposed to read <laughs> or that I'm on the hook for reading. Uh, and I'd rather read some other stuff instead, you know, like, um, so I, I've been lately, you know, from my world's of speculative fiction series, um, I'm going to be, uh, doing a I mean, shooting on, on Hyperion, uh, Cantos pretty soon and Dan Simmons. I wonder why I don't need that in there. Um, and this is the second book in, in, in that series. And I'm going to be filming on those probably this coming week, but I've also been reading, uh, the, the Witcher stuff by Sapkowski, you know, here's sort of destiny, fun stuff, easy to read, if I don't feel like reading the the Hume or rereading the Hume stuff that I'm supposed to be shooting videos on, which I'm also doing, uh, then you know I'll I'll read this and and I do a lot of reading as well in the bath, um, you know, I take baths pretty frequently because it's great for my uh, joint pain, and uh, I like reading in the bath too, um, as does uh, by the way Alistair McIntyre. Uh, something that came up in a conversation when we had that faculty uh, seminar together. All right. Um, Laps nine continuum, just a gesture of appreciation for these AMAs. Look forward to these month, uh, these every month. Yeah, I do too. I, I, I like doing these. Um, so uh, let's see. I'm going to start mostly taking things from people that I haven't had um, questions from. So Arl, Oliver Marcel, curious to hear your view on Jordan Peterson, actually. I think he's, you know, not even third rate. Um, I think that he captured a certain kind of vulnerable uh, young man zeitgeist that was appealing and rode uh, the wave of popularity and started believing a lot of his own bullshit and the bullshit people were saying about him. And he's become essentially a victim of his own success because he didn't have, uh, he didn't, you know, for all of his talk about like, you know, maturing and blah, 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 blah. He didn't, he didn't have what it took to withstand um, becoming an icon. Um and I think he's kind of a tragic figure, not somebody to, to emulate or really even to pay attention to at this point. Um, so, yeah, that's I mean, I've said lots of things about him over over the, the past, but I, I think he's just kind of at this point, you know, kind of a waste of time, uh, unfortunately. And it's, it's kind of sad to see what he's he's degenerated into. Lionel, uh, what philosophical movements that are prevailing at this generation, what do you think will be still dominant even in the next generations? I mean, I think that the field is so diverse right now. I don't know that there are movements that are anything other than locally prevailing at this point in time. You know, the philosophy goes through a lot of fads, but they all tend to be pretty parochial. So I don't, I don't know. I can't make a prediction about that. Uh, Tim Bernard, in France, philosophy is taught in high school. Do you think it's good? It's good if it's taught well. I mean, it's also taught in, in Germany and in uh, Portugal. I know about Portugal because some of my videos are part of the resources used in the national curriculum. Um, I mean, it, it can be good. It can also be stifling. It depends on who's doing the teaching, right? There isn't a, a standard answer for that. Um Navalistic, currently dealing <clears throat> with a mental problem because my dad passed away in pain, or in January. I'm getting more and more depressed and since today got rejected from Rollins College. So I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, as somebody whose you know, dad died when I was quite young, uh, that certainly sucks. Um, I'm sure you're, you're missing him and uh, the things that you used to do together. Um, and, um, you know, I would, I would try to see <clears throat> if you can um, connect up with other people. Support groups can be quite helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, try to take it easy on yourself. It's, it, it's, it's natural to be 
down when somebody dies. I mean, you may you may see this as kind of silly. It's definitely not like dad level stuff, but Sassy the cat was my constant companion, and uh, she died um, in my arms uh, just about before I put her down on on her her bed and her special blanket and uh, held her while she died um, back in in April, and I'm still missing her every single day, you know. And that's a cat. Um, and a cat is kind of a person, but isn't really a person as such. You know, the people that are close to us, it, it, we're bound to feel even even worse about that. So that is that is uh, natural and okay. And um, it's okay to, to feel depressed. Um, the question is, you know, can you can you still do some of the stuff, not all the stuff, but some of the stuff that you need to do for yourself? Like, you know, basic things, taking showers, making food for yourself rather than ordering in because you feel down, um, getting in some walks. I mean, walks are the easiest kind of exercise. And none of this is like a magic bullet that's going to like, you know, raise your mood or something like that. But every little bit does help, you know, when it comes to that. Maybe doing some some reading, like I was saying, some uh, guilty pleasure reading. Um I really do like these Sapowski books. Um, I'm glad that people insist that I should do them because uh, they're 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 quite a lot of fun. Um, but you know, doing things like that and and being gentle to yourself um, that it's not going to like snap you out of it, but it can it can get you through it. Roman, do you have any works you recommend on stoicism and addiction? I I don't, uh, and I think that. That is a niche that could certainly be explored. Um, it's not one that I have looked into much. Somebody who could talk about that, um, you could reach out to him, would be Donald Robertson, because you know he, he is a uh, CBT psychologist um, and, and therapist, and he's written quite a lot on, on stoicism and... Um, mental health. So he might be somebody to look into. Um, that's nice. Laps for, for nine continuum, uh, uh, offering a little bit of support here. I think that's, uh, and also AFIF, if that's, that's really awesome to, uh, to see. Uh, M, is there a compendium of all Heidegger lectures and or letters? Uh, yeah, there is. It's called, you know, the Gesamte Werke, right? Which is just German for collected works. <laughs> You know? And for for a lot of philosophers, you're, you'll see if you go into like a major research library, you'll typically see uh, for German philosophers, you know, Gesamte Werke. For French philosophers, you know, Oeuvre Complète. You know, um, I don't know what it would be for like Italian philosophers or people like that. But you'll see them like on on a shelf, and then it'll include letters and, and other things. You know. Um, and then the question is, are, are they translated? And a lot of Heidegger's stuff has been getting translated in the last 10 or so years. Much of it is now available in English, which is really quite cool. Um, I think that's a, a, a good thing. So, all right. Um, Folkening says, I'll have to follow you outside of YouTube for more metal-related content. Do you like Paul Chain's music as well? I don't know who that is. Um, any bands that you know that lean heavily on philosophical lyrical content? I don't. I don't really uh, know because I'm, I'm. I'm not listening to bands for philosophical content. I'm listening to bands because I was a metalhead before I was ever a philosopher. You know, I grew up listening to metal before I even realized that it was a genre as a kid. Um, and then really got into it, you know, I guess you could say from late middle school onward in the eighties. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have suggestions like that. Um, vegan sports bar. I like, I take preparing for death as living well. Yeah. The two of them are connected. I do think that there is something more to preparing for death than just living well. Um, certainly thinking about death does help you put things into perspective, right? 
But um, you also do want to think about what is the world going to be like after you exit it? What are you leaving behind? And I guess, yeah, I mean, that can orient your living well, but you think also about legacy or, you know, what it is that you're, what, what mark you're putting on the, uh, the world. Um, let's see here. Per weasel, does learning a new language influence how you think? For example, Latin or Greek? Yeah, I think um, it widens how you think. Um, I mean, it certainly affords you the opportunity to read works more attentively and closely. I mean, you, and you don't have to like necessarily read the whole work in its original language. Just being able to like, like think about those lobe editions. So I've got, an, here, here's one right here with Epictetus. So it's got the Greek on one side and the English translation, an old fashioned English translation on the other. So, you know, I might be like reading it in the English and be like, that sounds weird. What, what does the Greek say? Right. And then you can, you can figure it out. And then you might actually be like, oh, I want to keep reading this. Um, so there, there's, there's certainly that it's going to open up. I mean, stuff that hasn't been translated, if your Greek or Latin is good enough, then you can, you can read the stuff that hasn't been adequately translated, um, which is kind of nice to do. I mean, you can also, which is kind of funny, um, I check out Epictetus translations from the Greek into Latin. Sometimes they're pretty wild, too, from like the Renaissance, you know? When people, were, when translation was a little bit more fast and loose than it is today, um, so yeah, I mean, learning a foreign language and it doesn't have to be Greek or Latin; it could just be like learning Portuguese, you know, or learning Arabic. I mean, that would open up whole worlds for you in today's uh, setting, you know. Or I mean, if you want a really handy language, learn Mandarin. You know, I wish, I wish. Uh, I'd kept up with that because, boy, would that be a useful language to have. Um, Bernadine, popping in. Oh, just lost it for a second. Where, where did it go? Uh, there we go. Popping in to say hello and thank you for all you do. Once I'm out of grad school, through which you're helping me greatly, I set, I'm set to become a patron. Half Hour Hegel is indispensable. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Half Hour Hegel, by the way, is coming to a close pretty soon if I can get my crap together because I am hoping to finish the religion section, which is the second to last section of the book, uh, this month of December once I get done with the semester. And then it's just absolute knowing, which will take me through you know January and February and maybe into March. And then uh, I'll be moving on to another half hour something, probably Rene Descartes' meditations. Um, so, yeah. Um, Captain of the Nerd Guard, why do a lot of professional philosophers, yourself included, dislike Bertrand Russell? Uh, because sometimes he's full of crap, you know, uh, which is not unique to Bertrand Russell, but um, he's got his takes on things and, and uh, he gets portrayed. There, there's a lot of people, because his, his books are so readily available, right? His history of philosophy, which is okay in some parts and then, you know, wrong in other parts. Um, there's a lot of people who think, oh, it's on a bookshelf. It must be true. So I'll, I'll go buy that book. I mean, I would say that Russell is a better historian of philosophy than say Will Durant, you know, with his story of philosophy, but not incredibly better. And, you know, Russell was kind of an arrogant prick sometimes to people. Um, I mean, he's got some interesting things. I mean, that that whole Logisus project is kind of cool to check out. It's a failure, like most projects are, but there's cer certainly something admirable about trying that out, right? Um, Siddharth, what do you think of Marxism shaping the future world as, as it is shaping right now? I don't think Marxism is shaping the future world right now, so... Um, Max Montague, thanks for the Aristotle core concepts. Just finished an ancient philosophy class where we went through the Nick and McCain ethics and your videos helped tremendously. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, I mean, um, that is one text that I have done videos covering the entire thing. I think it's about maybe uh, close to 100 videos or so, core concept videos. There's other texts where 
I've only done portions of them. Like, you know, I've done um, metaphysics book one, politics book one, bits of rhetoric book two. Uh, I, 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 there's a lot of other Aristotle I probably need to do. Um, Siddharth, I can't find any lectures on Whiteheadian philosophy of yours. Do you teach that? Very few people teach Whitehead these days. Um, and if you can't find it in, in the thing, then I probably don't teach it, you know? Um, pretty straightforward. I think Whitehead is cool, but I think that there's hundreds of philosophers that I could be doing stuff on. Um, there's nothing super special about Whitehead. Zach, do you have any experience with schizophrenia through yourself or others? Yeah, a little bit of experience, not myself. Um, I have met some schizophrenics and interacted with them. Um, I come from a family where the mental illnesses tend to be bipolar disorder and depression. Uh, some people actually just wind up being manic, like my mom probably was. Um, and, you know, I know I, I've, I've interacted with quite a few people not so much in my family, but in other places that have borderline personality disorder. But I don't, I don't interact a lot with schizophrenics. So, um, let's see. Do, do, do. Dan Beckloyd, here's a good question: How do you hold your book in the bath to make sure you don't drop it in the water? I mean. You just hold it. <laughs> I don't think this is that that difficult. You lay in the water and, you know, you got your book and you hold it up. You can even do it with one hand if it's a sufficiently small book. Um, so I, I don't know. This is, this is not something that I had to spend a lot of time thinking about, I think. Um, all right. Uh, Let's see here. Juice box. Please explain the difference between agnostic atheism and general atheism. I don't know that there's a difference. Uh, these are just terms that people are throwing around out there. Uh, Memory Rose. Have you read Dostoevsky's The Idiot? What, if so, what did you think about it? Yeah, so I, I did read The Idiot, and it's been many, many years since I've read it, so it's probably due for a reread. I had read other Dostoevsky stuff before that, and I, you know, I enjoyed The Idiot, but I didn't find it that, I didn't find it quite as interesting as, you know, like the Notes from the Underground or Crime and Punishment or the bits of Brother Karl Mazoff that I'd read or later on, The Demons. Um, and maybe I missed something in it, but I, I just didn't get into it as much. Um one tree four is it reasonable to sight read ancient greek texts after a few years of study um no uh every ancient greek writer that you're going to run across you wind up having to learn some additional vocabulary that winds up being important for them um and so you know being able to read Aristotle and Plato and Epictetus isn't necessarily going to prepare you for reading, say, Greek tragedy and sight read it. Um, you, you know, you, you'll certainly have some facility with it after a few years. And, you know, with a lexicon, you can kind of work your way through things. But, I mean, I don't think that should be the, the goal to be able to sight read because we have other stuff, you know. Uh, Ricky, the more I listen to the apology, I realize Socrates did not know when to quit when he was ahead. Well, that's one interpretation of it. Or it was that he knew he was going to lose and he wanted to make some points in the trial. Uh, or, you know, there's like other alternative explanations of it. So, Casper, will you do an episode series on uh, Chorin? Uh, maybe way, way down the line unless somebody wants to commission a series. I mean, it's anybody who wants to um, hire me to take time away from what it is that I'm already doing and focus on their particular thing. I mean, same thing would go for Whitehead. If they want to front the money to do that, I'm perfectly willing to do that because uh, that means taking time away from my, my other projects, right? 
Uh, oh, Ken's here. Uh, Ken is another long, long time interactor. Uh, also somebody who knows a lot about metal, uh, both uh, in terms of like the lore and experientially. Definitely agree that Sapkowski's Witcher books are very good reads. Yeah, I was, I was surprised by how much I am enjoying them. Um, I, I read um, the first one and the third one because I was able to get them at a used bookstore. And now I've got this second one. And I forget what the fourth one is, is called. Um, Time of Contempt. I, 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 so I'm halfway through Sword of Destiny. And then I'm going to read Time of Com Contempt. And I'm going to do next year, uh, I'm going to do a session in the worlds of speculative fiction on those those four books. Um, those those are really a lot of fun. Um, Arturo, any good book recommendations for AI fiction that are not well known? You know, I don't know that I would be somebody who would know what's not well known. I mean, obviously there's like, you know, Gibson's uh, cyberpunk stuff, right? But I think those are pretty well known, um, starting with Neuromancer. I mean, there's... Uh, uh, a lot of interesting stuff going on with AIs in, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ian Banks culture series. Of course they play in a, a really important role in Simmons's uh, Hyperion Cantos. Um, where else is AI playing a really important role? Um, good question. You know, uh, I'd have to think about that more. I mean, obviously, um, Philip K. Dick, right? But Philip K. Dick is very well known. So I, I don't know about who's the poorly known thinker or writers because I, I don't read, you know, I don't read all that widely. Um, we need somebody who, who really knows the field well in the contemporary field. Um Dan Becklood, I especially like the discussions in The Witcher about freedom, destiny, and fatalism. I don't think I've gotten to too many of them yet. Um, but I, I, there's a lot of great ethical discussions, too, going on. Uh, Tim Bernard, do you think skepticism is becoming some kind of political scientism along with political environmental movement? Will they remain rational at their core? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't really have an answer to that because, you know, skepticism, uh, are you talking about the skeptic movement, not skepticism, which is, you know, kind of like a bunch of philosophical points of view, um, becoming some kind of political scientism. I mean, I don't know what political scientism means. Um, will they remain rational at their core? Nobody's truly rational at their core. We're a mix of rationality and irrationality. So... Uh, the Philosophical Irish Drunk, that's quite a name. Opinions on David Benatar, Antinatalist Contemporary Philosophy. I haven't read them. Um, so I don't I don't really have much to say about that. I mean, I've you know, I've encountered like you could say the fringes of the antinatalist movement, but I, I've never really read anything in it. So I I don't think I'd be competent to say much. Um Ken says, I think AI features in some of uh, Crichton's books. Could be. I, I haven't read too much of his stuff. Um, Andre says, so speaking of AI, I've heard you saying that what we have today can't really be considered AI. Why is that the case? How far are we from true AI? No idea how far we are from true AI. What I, what I have to say is that much of what we have is only metaphorically intelligent. It's not real intelligence, and it's quite far from displaying anything that would genuinely be intelligent. And I think that, you know, Descartes is particularly the discourse on method part five is a great touchstone for this. He says, what would allow us to differentiate human beings from machines? And he talks about the ability of, of human beings to use language to signify their thoughts. And you could say, well, but a machine can do that. It can report about its own condition. Yeah, that's not quite the same thing as thoughts. Um, that's following programming, right? And then also the machine, uh, the one thing, it, you know, can do lots of things really well, but it doesn't have the sort of fluidity of human beings. 
um, being able to do many things, not necessarily well, but being able to do them. Human beings at this point in time still have incredible advantages over machines once you get those machines outside of their narrow areas of, you know, program competence. And, you know, neural networks are not learning. Um, the stuff that we call machine learning is that's just a metaphor. That's not, it's not really learning. It's regurgitating, uh, you know, digested things that we fed it. Um, so, you know, we're, I think we got to be careful in, in talking about uh, AI. Um, I have no problem with people using the word, um, but, you know, it, it's still largely just a metaphor um, and people believe in it as if it's not a metaphor. Uh, per Weasel, do you like classical music? Yeah, I like some classical music. I'm not necessarily a fan of, you know, all of it. Um, and, you know, if I had to pick, like, who's my favorite composer, probably Prokofiev, you know. Um, we're really fortunate in that just a few blocks from here, we have the Bradley Hall, which houses the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. And we have an extraordinary symphony orchestra and conductor here in Milwaukee for a city of our size. And we, um, you know, we put aside the money to become season ticket holders. And, you, you know, if you follow me on social media, every once in a while you see me and Andy uh, at the MSO, you know, uh, going to a performance. I often will photograph what the, uh, the playbill is of that day. So, yeah, I like classical music. Um, you know, I like things other than metal. Uh, there's, there's, I, I don't have the range that my wife Andy has, but I, I do like quite a few things. All right. Well, it is one thirty. I, uh, have a event at two o'clock. Um, so I'm gonna have to get something to eat. Um, but we'll go out if anybody has any, any last questions, uh, for me to, to tackle. I can hang out for maybe a couple minutes more and then got to heat up myself a, a meatball sandwich that Andy made yesterday for, for our dinner. Uh, we've got a couple extra and then I've got to get on with my Patreon supporters. Oh, philosophical Irish drunk favorite drink. Um, yeah, I don't know that I have a favorite drink. I have, I have things that I like quite a bit. I like beer, you know, um, usually, you know, Good stuff. Not, not, uh, um, oh, the Miller light sign is down. That's interesting. I guess there was high winds. I was just going to gesture. We have the Miller light, uh, thing, which is just piss water. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, I like, uh, good coffees. I, I drink about two pots of coffee a day from Stone Creek, our local roaster here. I like, um, hot chocolate, you know, not a big wine drinker, although I do like port quite a bit. Um, I'm not a big hard liquor drinker either, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's probably it. Um, vegan sports bar says, love the Plutarch series. Oh, glad, uh, you know, and I'm going to do more stuff on Plutarch in the future. Cause he's a really interesting guy. Uh, laps for continuum. Thanks as always for a good discussion. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. So that's, that's probably a good place to wrap this up. Thanks to everybody for your questions and comments and i will see you next time we do have a few events coming up this this month like i mentioned um doing uh dan simmons uh this book and the book before it hyperion cantos um we may have a few other things that are not on the calendar yet depending on how much energy i end up having um and uh yeah we've got you know little bits and pieces here and there. And you'll see a lot of videos and podcast episodes coming out this month. So, all right, I'll see everybody and talk to you next time.